Are you rolling, Abby? Okay. All right, that's okay. You can do that. That's fine. You dress right for it. Yeah. And he said he's been a little chilly, so this is good for him. Oh. So. <laughs> Somebody will enjoy the heat in here. Okay. Anytime. Okay, my name is Tupac Shakur, and I attend Tamapai High School, and I'm 17 years old. Do you like being 17? And it's like, 17 is such a weird age. It's such a in the middle age. You're not 18 yet, and you're older than 16. So. But I like it. It's nice. It's like a learning stage for me. So you wish you could be 18 and you get some more rights? Well, 18 will bring lots of responsibilities that I don't want but it'll bring respect that I feel like that's the only way I can get it. You know, I try to be as mature as I can be and demand it wherever I can get it. But 18 is like, you're an adult. You, you, like today, when I had to sign the release form, I felt so bad because I couldn't sign it myself. I had to go and get my mother's and all that. But um, 18 is it's just society's way of saying that you're ready. But 17, like I think I'm ready now, as ready as I'm going to be in this world. But so it's okay, I guess 17 is all right. Do you think that uh, you should be given more responsibilities or that you have much more value than adults place on you because of your age? Well, well, the way that my mother brought me up is no lies, no, you know, total truth. Everything is real in society, you know, everything. If something's going on wrong in the house, I know everything. So I was, it was like I was given the responsibility before I wanted it. And so now I can't really differentiate what great responsibility is because I've had it for so long. You know, so she, she taught me how to be ready for it. And so that's good, and I think it's good because I know that, it, and it's taught me that when you get out there, the responsibility is staggering. And I'm ready, I'm going to be a little more ready than someone who's grown up um, in Disney World, you know, with Santa Claus is coming, mm -hmm. and so you know, I'm, I think I'm growing up good, as in all sense of the word. I think I'm growing up and learning about responsibilities and everything. What do you think is the hardest thing about being, you know, being your age? The hardest thing about being my age is proving to society that I understand what's going on. Like we not everybody, but frequently teenagers are stereotyped in being loud music loving, girl chasing, car wanting, not caring about the world, coke heads, you know, <laughs> drinking coke and smoking and being drug addicts. And, and I mean, in some ways we are. I mean, I chase girls and want the car and loud music, but I'm, I, I like to think of myself as really being socially aware and not just socially aware as, as being trendy, you know, being peace, not that. I really think that um, that teenagers, they got a lot of responsibilities and a lot of burdens because, in fact, we're not, I mean, we're given a horrible world. We're given the gift that we're getting when we got to take over. It's horrible. They left us. They're leaving this world in bad shape for us to fix up. So I think that we deserve a lot of respect. Because, you know, in the 60s, you, they changed a lot, and those teenagers were given respect because they, they changed a lot, and they did a lot. We're given no respect, and we have to do a lot. I mean, the world, no secret, but the world is in bad shape. So we have to do a lot. We have to do a lot of good things. So I think we deserve a little bit more respect. And why do you think it is that adults don't give you the respect you deserve? Fear. They're scared. They're, they're scared of watching us grow up. They're scared that when we get the power or responsibilities that we won't be able to handle it. And they're scared that, that uh, well, I don't think, in this generation, I don't think that a lot of adults put enough into their children. I'm glad my mother did, but I don't think that a lot of children growing up lost in the sauce. And I think that they're scared because they're realizing it now that, uh-oh, we didn't, we didn't, I didn't teach him this, I didn't teach him that. We did really learn it. Look at, look at, Unsafe sex and drugs. And you could tell if you look at the statistics, they they're staggering again, you know. And so I think they're scared because they're realizing that they goofed, they really messed up. And um, also, the, they fear te teenagers are angry. At least this generation seems a little angrier to me and a little bit more rebellious. 
and uninvolved. So they're scared because they're realizing that, you know, what's going to happen when you get all these people in power? But also just because it's human nature to be scared to watch a child grow up and you don't want to give them that yet. Um, I was funny. Being a kid, like my little cousin, Hiroji, he's three, and everything to him is happy. The only thing that, that makes him unhappy is when you turn, when things are over, when you turn something off and when the television goes off, when it's time to go to bed, or when he has to come in the house. It's, it, everything is over. That's bad, you know? And when you're an adult, when something is over, that's, like... It's the opposite, you know, when it's over, it's good, you know, you just, oh, I'm off work, it's over, you know, vacation, it's over, oh, God, she's out of the house, my children in college, it's over, oh, my God, and so it's that difference, but, and children see things so great, if the world can, what happens is that adults complicate things, and children don't, you, the simple, as simple as this, the sky is blue. And adults want to go, the sky is blue. Why is it blue? Because birds and bees and it, everything wasn't meant to be analyzed. And that's where a lot of problems came in, I think. And that's where I think kids are happier. Kids are definitely happier and more relaxed than adults. Do you think if, if um, parents or adults had uh, happier childhoods, they would, they would be better off when they grow up? I mean, like a lot of people say if you have a troubled childhood, you, you lack self-esteem when you grow up. No, actually, I think it's, well, okay, my mother, from my mother's point, well, if you grew up happy, too happy, you know, like in fairy tale land, not fairy tale, I mean, if you grew up where, you know, every Christmas you got a present and every birthday you got a present and every holiday was a holiday and everything was peachy, your parents took care of everything and you just grew up, I don't think that prepares you for the world. You know, my mother had a really bad childhood and my father had a bad childhood, and I had a bad childhood, but I love my childhood. Even though it was bad, I love it. I feel like it's taught me so much, and I, I feel like nothing can faze me. You know, nothing in this world, nothing can surprise me. It might set me back, but only momentarily, only to spring back, and I think it's helped me um, to learn. It really did help me to learn, and since my mother had a bad childhood, she knows the importance of being honest and the importance of Facing each situation as it comes and not dealing in the fairy tale land. Being realistic about the problem and analyzing it and solving it. See what you can do to solve it. So if you have a happy childhood, you tend to want your child to have a happy childhood. So you tend to want to keep the bad things out. And I don't think that's good because you don't prepare them for the world. Mm -hmm. So basically, you, you have to be realistic with your children. Right, you definitely have to be realistic. There, you, have to you should tell them. But don't get the wrong idea. I feel like I'm being gloomy. I don't, I don't mean just be like, damn it, it's bad out there. But I mean, when the good things come and they are going to come and everybody knows that good things are going to come and you're going to see them for yourself, you're going to see that they're good. But it's harder to see the bad things and everybody wants to shield the bad things. And that's where it gets complicated and it gets real rotten. That's when everybody gets surprised and, oh my God, I'm committing suicide. That's too much overwhelming. If it doesn't, if you know about it, it won't be so overwhelming. You know, so that's what I think about that. Is, is that, you know, like if you're lost, if you are lost in the wilderness and you have a guide, then it's not like being lost. It's like learning new things as you go through. So when you finally get through, you forgot where you were going to. You just want to talk about the path that you just went. And that's how I feel. Like like life, my child, I was just totally lost at first because, okay, I got to go to the beginning. My mother was a Black Panther, and she was really involved in, the movement, you know, just black people bettering themselves and things like that. My father was a hustler, street hustler, you know. I think he, you know, sold drugs and everything. And how did they get together is beyond me, but he just saw her as a woman doing something, and just like, you know. But so my mother and father both had bad childhoods. And I never knew who my father was. I met him, but he died, and that was horrible. But got over that. My mother took, actually, it's like she actually did take me through life. 
you know, when I would go, when I discovered her, so first I rebelled against her because she was in the movement and we never spent time together because she was always speaking and going to colleges and everything. And then after that was over, it was more time spent with me and, and we were both just like, you're my mother and she was like, you're my son and what do we do? So then she was really close with me and really strict almost. But I, now I can see how it paid off because like, I could talk to my mother about drugs, I could talk to my mother about sex, anything, I can ask her anything and bring it up and she'll go, okay, well this is do da da da. And I, I can say, Ma, I'm really curious about this drug. And she'll go, I did it and this is what happened and I, mean, I don't think you should. I mean, do you think other kids can talk to their friends if you do what you're trying to do? No, I don't think so. Because I speak to my friends, I speak to them and they, they're baffled. They're like, they could sit, they, like, my friends can call my mother by her first name. That's a small thing, but it's a big thing to them because they could just come in the house and go, how you doing, Faye? And this is what happened at school. Because she speaks to them. She gives teenagers the respect they deserve unless they show that they're not worthy of that respect. And they like that. They really do like that, and they, they react well. That's why I have that philosophy about respect. Because um, my mother can totally, I mean, she's totally brilliant, totally understanding and caring. And she's human. I mean, she has mistakes, and we have our little tiss, but I understand them so much. I mean, she'll be wrong a lot, and we'll, I'll, we can talk about it. So, but a lot of kids can't talk to their parents about drugs because their parents don't trust them to make the decision, so they make the decision for them. And a lot of kids can't talk to their parents about sex because they don't trust them. They think, oh, he's talking about sex, he's out there doing it. So they don't trust them in that, you know? So, plus their parents are just like beat red as soon as you bring up the word fornication. But my mother's totally just, it was, I was scared at first, but I just brought it up one day and we spent hours talking about drugs, sex, and society, and 60s, and 70s, and 30s, and everything. And we just get along really good. Yeah, a really good friend. But she's still my mother. I mean, I still, like last night I came home at 2.30 and she went, you can't come home that late anymore. And I was like, it's the weekend. We had an argument about that. But also it's things that, you know, like, I mean, there's, we talk about things. You know, do you think you should be punished? And I explain it to her. And we, I really get to talk to her. So she's my guide through life. So I'm really enjoying myself, but... It's just that it's everybody doesn't think like us. So society, I mean, poverty is, it's no joke. Being poor and having this philosophy is worse because, you know, if money was nothing, if there was no money and everything depended on your moral standards and the way that you behaved and the way that you treated people, we'd be millionaires, we'd be rich. But since it's not like that, then we're stone broke we're just poor because our ideals always get in the way. Since we're not yup yup people, and we're always, wait a minute, let me think about that, then people tend to go, nope, I guess I don't want you for the job, and I guess you just won't, you know? And so that that's the only thing that I'm bitter about, is growing up poor because I missed out on a lot of things. Still growing up poor, you know, I miss out on a lot of things, and I can't always have what I want or even things that I think I need. So I missed a lot of things like that, but I know rich people or people just well off who are lost, who are lost. So I feel like my mother made, it, made a lot of decisions in her life, and that's what we always say. Um, she could have chose to go to college and got a degree in something and right now been well off, but she chose to um, analyze society and fight and do things better, so this is the payoff. And she always tells me that the payoff to her is that me and my sister grew up good and we have good minds and everything and we can we're, we're ready for society, but we just didn't have money and we didn't have the things like that. So that's the only bad thing I think is poverty. If I hated anything, it'd be that. And what do you think is one of the most important things that your mother taught you? My mother taught me three things respect, knowledge, search for knowledge. It's an eternal, eternal journey. That's like my hair cut the line. 360 degrees, find knowledge, always. And, and she taught me to not be quiet, to, if there's something in my mind, speak it. That's what God, that was the breath. She always taught, but also to listen. And she always, she told me this little joke that God gave you two ears to listen and one mouth to speak. Two ears and one mouth. 
common sense. One mouth, you should speak, but you should also listen. And that's where the knowledge comes from, listening. And once you get the knowledge, then you can speak. And it helps you. So she taught me respect, knowledge, and understanding, mostly. You know, just listen a lot. Do you think more parents should listen to their kids more? Definitely. Oh, definitely. Definitely. But not being a yup, yup parent. Like yup, yup people. You know, just not being, oh, yes, dear, I understand. Yes, you can go to the party. That doesn't help. Those produce even worse kids because it produces ambitious but unready children, you know? And those are the, those where our martyrs come from, you know? So I think they should listen but analyze what they're saying. Just put them, just don't push them through the path and don't hold them from going to the path but help them through the path. That's what I think should happen. I'm most like my mom because I'm arrogant, totally arrogant. I agree. I have to say it. Like at work, I, I can't hold the job. I, I just quit my job today, actually, because I wanted to come and do this. And they wouldn't let me. And I felt like it was important, and it was more important than serving pizza. And we had enough people. So I felt like since I'm an actor, they should understand. They should have let me do it. But they didn't. And then I had a cold. So they were making me work in a freezer. And I'm, I'm really not one to be disrespected. And I felt like that was disrespectful because I asked to go, you know. So I quit. And he told me I couldn't quit. And that even made me hyper. I'm arrogant. So when he told me I couldn't quit and we had all these customers, I chose that time to jump on a soapbox, grab my leather jacket, light a cigarette in front of him, smoke, and leave in the middle of a rush. So that was natural. That's arrogance at the top. That's what I think I'm most like my mother. And she likes it. She'll see it in me and know it. And we clash a lot because I'm arrogant, she's arrogant. And, and you should see us when we get in our little attitude moves. It's like husband and wife, or it's brother and sister. But it's father, mother, and it's really father, mother, and son. She's my father and mother. So, um, yeah, we get in our tips and everything. But it's good. That's a very interesting point. <laughs> That's why my pizza took so long. <laughs> <laughs> it was me, I admit it. Okay, well, you, you were saying how much you liked her. What, how are you most unlike her? I'm most like unlike my mother because, mm, that's a crazy question. Um, well, since my mother went through the 60s and everything, she's more of a let me think about this first, then do it. Because I know about how that happens. And I'm more like a... If I get, if you get me hyped, I'm a dangerous weapon. If I'm hyper, I mean, even for, not like violent, like, but if I'm hyper to do, if I'm hyper to run basketball and I have to go to work, I'll be there late. If I'm hyper to do something, I can't concentrate. And my mother can really concentrate. And like in school, as much as I talk about needing education and everything, I goof in school every year. It's just I can't help it. I like popularity and I like being around people. And, I just like, you know, talking and everything. And my mother's more of a get this done and then do that. So that's what we're, un we're not alike, you know, and I trust people more and I'm more open. And since she's been through those things, she's more weary of trusting people, but she does trust people, but I'm just totally just like, oh, okay, you're my friend now, you know. But we're more alike than we are unlike. That's really weird. Well, you said you do spend a lot of school. Do you feel you're learning enough or do you feel like you'd be doing a better job at teaching yourself? Well, oh, I hope I don't get in trouble, but um, school is, I think that we got so caught up in school being a tradition that we stopped using it as a learning tool, which it should be. Like, up to this day, I mean, school should be, I think there should be a different curriculum in each and every, like, neighborhood, you know? Because I'm going to Tam, Tamapai High, and I'm learning about the basics, but they're not basic for me, you know? And it's like, they're, they're not... To, to get us ready for today's world, they're not, that's not helping. It's just what they took, so it's what we're gonna take, you know? And that's why the streets have taught me. And, um, but school is really important, reading, writing, arithmetic. But I think after you learn reading, writing, arithmetic, that's it. But what they tend to do is teach you reading, writing, arithmetic, then teach you reading, writing, arithmetic again, then again, then again, just making it harder and harder, just so, to keep you busy. And I, that's where I think they messed up. There should be a class on drugs. 
It should be a class on sex education, a real sex education class, not just pictures and diaphragms and unlogical terms and things like that. There should be a drug class. There should be sex education. There should be a class on scams. There should be a class on religious cults. There should be a, a class on police brutality. There should be a class on apartheid. There should be a class on racism in America. There should be a class on why people are hungry, but they're not. Their class is on gym, you know, <laughs> physical education. Let's learn volleyball because one day we're going to, you know, it's, it's, their class is like algebra. We have yet to go to a store and said, um, can I have X, Y plus two and give me my Y change back, thank you. You know, I, I, can, I think you could let me out. I've lived, I've lived alone by myself. And the things that, that, I, that helped me were the things that I learned from my mother and from the streets. And reading has helped me. I mean, school has taught me reading, which is, I love. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's it. Like foreign languages. I think they're important, but I don't think it should be required. Because actually they should be teaching you English and then teaching you how to understand double talk, politicians double talk, not teaching you how to understand French and Spanish and German. When am I going to Germany? I can't afford to pay my rent in America. How am I going to Germany? You know, this is, the, I, this is, this is what I mean by the basics and not the basics for me. And I think that it should be like college, you can go and take the classes that you want. And I think that like elementary school should be that way, where, you, where they give you the classes you should take for the basics. And then junior high school and high school should be the classes that you need in order to, to choose your path. So do you feel like the schools are not really listening to the kids' needs? Or Definitely not. Needs? Definitely it's not. It's just kind of a place where you go to, but it's, it's become such a tradition. They're not yeah. even concerned that you're learning. It's just something you have to do. It's just a place you go during the day to keep you busy while they're at work. While they're at work, that's exactly what it is. Are you ready to work now? Yeah, I've actually been working already, you know, like, I've been going to school during the day, then I work eight hours at the pizza place, then go home. And if I'm, isn't it like 40 hour a week, that's what adults work, right? And that's what I'm working, 40 hours a week. I'm still not getting the respect that adults get, you know, but I'm not, I don't want to keep saying like I'm worried about respect and fame and all of that. I'm just saying that, I mean, ancient civilizations have survived without, um, going to schools like this. I mean, they've learned from their past. It's, it's, we're not being taught to deal with the world as it is. We're being taught to deal with this fairyland, which we're not even living in anymore. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sad, because I'm telling you, and it's, it should not be me telling you. It should be common knowledge. Aren't they wondering why um, death rates are going up and suicide is going up and drug abuse? Aren't they wondering? Don't they understand? That more people are, I mean, more kids are being handed crack than they're being handed diplomas. I mean, it shouldn't, I mean, like, okay, in school we're learning to analyze. And then, well, I learned it now. They should relearn it. I think adults should go through school again. You know, I think that, I think that rich people should live like poor people and poor people should live like rich people. And it should change every week. And we'll have the best rounded people we'll be able to deal with people. I mean... And, I mean, everywhere. Look at civilizations. Look how we grew. You know, and I think we need to learn from our mistakes and stop just going through emotions, which we're doing now. It's like we're waiting for some big button to be pushed or something like that. Can you hear me? Let's answer that. I mean, uh, what, what can you do when, when you grow up, right? Okay. That, that you can make a difference. In well, as it is, and it's honestly, honestly, I feel this way, but society is like, I mean, it's like, you know those little things they have for the mice where they go through around the circle and they have little blocks for it and everything? Well, society is like that. They'll let you go as far as you want, but as soon as you start asking too many questions and you're ready to change, boom, their block will come. And for me, and I hope it doesn't start anything, but for me, since I'm living in a, in a slummish area and I'm black, minds will come through being a statistic. You know, I'll get caught up in all of this and one day I'll be with my friends and they'll go, let's go out party. We don't have a car. Let's steal a car. Forget it. You know, let's just borrow a car. We'll steal a car and I'll go to jail for 16 years and come out and be bitter. Knowing all of this, saying all of this, but be bitter, you know. And it should be, I mean, 
like like the past elections, watching Jesse Jackson run and watching Dukakis run. Those two people, Jesse Jackson and Dukakis, two people who I thought were gonna, there it is. I said, all right, finally, we're gonna get a better America. But what happened, Bush won. I couldn't believe it because every time I asked people, who would you have voted for? And they're like, it was Dukakis. But how did Bush win? I keep wondering. And then that just makes me rebel more against society because it's supposed to represent the people. I don't want Bush in government. I spent eight years of my 17 years on this earth under Republicans, under Ronald Reagan, under an uh, ex-actor who lies to the people, who steals money, and who's done nothing at all for me. And I don't think Bush is a bad person or a bad president, because for the upper class, he's a perfect president. And that's how society is built. The upper class run it while we talk about it. I mean the middle class and lower class, we talk about it. And for the working class, we're just lost. We're going through the motions. We're the, we're the worker bees. And they get to live like royalty. You, you think when you're talking about classes, do you think children or kids are sometimes considered the lower class? Yeah, I think so. Um, but they're, even in, in even with children, there are their classes. Like, um, even at TAM, there there's there's the, the lower Marin City class. There's the low... Um, white class, the lower white class, there's the middle class white class and the middle class black class and there's the middle class, um, I mean there's the upper class white and upper class black and it's, that's a shame that it that has to be cut in so many pieces because it all boils down to this one piece of money that, how can, like how can, this is a big question, no one's been able to answer it and this is staggering, how can Reagan live in a white house which has a lot of rooms and there'd be homelessness? And he's talking about helping homelessness. This is what I mean about practicality. All right, if there's someone homeless in Washington, D.C., if there's homelessness and he has the White House, which has a thousand rooms, why can't he take some of them people off the street and put them in his White House? Because he doesn't want to get dirty. The White House would be a little tainted. And when his rich people from Jamaica and everything comes to see him, they'll be, oh, these people, you know? And that's dumb. He wants to build houses and everything. Let him stay in the White House. All those rooms are not being used. Then he'll have people from the streets to help him make with, with his ideas. I mean, these people that are homeless have done things. They, they haven't been homeless forever. They've done things in society. They've done things. They've had jobs before, and they've done things. They've worked hard. That should be an automatic. They get a house somewhere and live comfortably. There are things they can do, you know? And, and I think that's wrong. I think that's really bad. No, last night I was in Baltimore. Year before that I was in, I spent three years in Baltimore, my high school years, going to the School of Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. Then, before that I was in New York. That's where I grew up. That was my total growing up part. We moved out of New York because um, all of these, the, because of my mother's choices, you know, and she couldn't keep it, she couldn't keep her job because of her choices. Because it was like too much. Reaction? Yeah, no, it was, she was calm now. I mean, it was totally calm, but it was like, they figured out who she was, and she couldn't keep a job. That should be illegal. So she lost her job, and of course, we were like stranded in New York. And Is he directing that? Yeah, so we stranded in New York. So we moved to um, Baltimore, which was total ignorance town to me because, okay, it was just like, I mean, in Baltimore, it's just ignorant. I don't even, it gets me upset to talk about it. Baltimore has the highest rate of teenage pregnancy, the highest rate of AIDS within the low, um, black community, the highest rate of um, teens killing teens, and the highest rate of teenage suicide, and the highest rate of blacks killing blacks in Baltimore, Maryland. And this is where we chose to live. So as soon as I got there, being the person I am, I said, no, no, I'm changing this. So I started a Stop the Killing campaign, and um, Safe Sex campaign, and AIDS prevention campaign, and everything. And then I came back, and I felt like I did a lot of good. I did good things and everything. Came back. The second week I was in California, I got a call, and two of my friends were shot dead in the head. Two of the friends that, that were working with me shot dead in the head. And it's just like, why try 
because this is what happened. But I, I still try, you know. And I came to California to escape that, escape that violence that I escaped New York for. Then I went to Baltimore, escaped Baltimore for, came to California. Come to Marin City, and there's skinheads violence. There's racial violence, which I deplore. I can't stand racism in any form, shape, or color. I can't stand it. So what I did was I talked, talked to people and everything, and what happened was Tam is really integrated. So there was a party. And it just happened that it was a white girls party and everybody goes, it doesn't matter. And there's, there's, there's racism, but it's not like that. You know, we understand each other and we're children. We're able to talk to each other about it. So everybody went to this party and I was working and I was going to go to the party right after I got off work, me and my friends. So we, on, we got off work, we're on our way to the party, we're laughing and joking, just going through. We see our friend Jonas, who's white, and he's telling us um, there was a fight at the party. And I was like, what happened? He said the skinheads came and told, called the black people niggas and made them, they said they had to leave, and of course, it was fight. I was like, oh my God. So we were sitting there, me and my, they went home, we were sitting there talking and everything, and me and my friends were just like, this couldn't happen in the 60s, you know, let's figure out what to do. And you just have, I said, I know, we'll start the Black Panthers again. So we're starting the Black Panthers, but we're doing it more to fit our, our views, you know, less violent and more silent, you know, more knowledge to help, you know. What we really want to do is get the pride back in the black community because I feel like if you can't respect yourself, then you can't respect your race, then you can't respect another's race, then you can't respect, you know, it just has to do with respect, like my mother taught me. So um, what, we want, what we're doing is starting the Black Panthers again in Marin City, just getting first teaching pride and then teaching education and then we'll see where it goes from there. And also as a defense mechanism for the skinheads because that's wrong, and I hate to feel helpless. And so skinheads hate black people, and I'm gonna be there. I'm, I want to. I have this vision of just us growing and them decreasing, because that's how knowledge works. It's contagious, you know. And so, if there was war and peace, peace wins out. So I wanted to. Be, I want. I just want to form it and let it work. And I know the skinheads are gonna go like this. So. And I want to take, you know, I just want to learn from our mistakes. And I'm talking to a lot of the ex-members of the Panthers from the 60s, and they're helping me because they're less violent. They, you know, they, they've learned. So, and they did a lot of good things in the past, and we can do a lot of good things. So since my mother was an ex-Panther, and talking to Geronimo Pratt and a lot of ex-Minister defenses and everything, so we're, we're going to do a lot of good. I feel like we're going to do a real lot of good. No, I know as soon as I walk out, I'll go, oh, God, I should have said that. But um, just to end the importance of growing up in, I mean, just growing up in America, is a, I loved my childhood, but I hated growing up poor, and it made me very bitter. You know, it's like, all right, now I got a job. I had to I quit now. I had a job. And just to, to, today I got paid and I have money in my pocket that I worked for. And that the greatest feeling, you know, that I worked for. I'm just getting a job and I'm working and everything. And that feels good. But I'm still poor, you know. I'm, my family is still poor. I'm still living in a poor neighborhood. You know, I still see people poor. I, I still see things that, like, society, she, it's, this is supposed to be a melting pot, but no one's learning from the other's mistake. And that's where the tragedy comes because if we were all open and everything, we would learn from, like, in Marin City, I've seen already deaths. I mean, this lady slashed the man's throat because he spit on her kids, and I've seen teenagers fighting last night over girls, and I've seen guys speak to women with this much respect, and I deplore that. My mother is just told, I grew up, my mother raised me, so I have this much respect for women, and. I, and we, I fight often because of that. And it gives me a lot of friends. I mean, I, I get a lot of friends, because, but I also, I, I get a lot of friends because I have respect for women, ultra respect for women. But then, like, I, I, was, I was liking this girl in, in Tam, and, um, and I'm extra nice, you know, extra gentleman. I'm extra just like, oh, you're beautiful, and you deserve the best. And she told me I was too nice. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. We, we, it wouldn't work because I was too nice. That was the ultimate stab in the back. So I went through a week of just going, forget it, I'm just going to be like them. Because they seem to get the girls and they're, they're, 
they call girls the B word, you know, and they smack and beat and they are get they're getting girls and I'm going, peace and I think you're beautiful and I'm and they're going to be, well, I like him because he's masculine. I'm masculine. I mean, and with the guys, I'm trying and like yesterday he was cursing and I was like, don't curse. And he got mad at me because I told him not to curse. But what I'm my plan is that if I keep telling girls not to let them call you these names, and I keep telling if I keep saying it, it's gonna catch on because the girls won't allow them to be their boyfriend if they're gonna speak to them like that and they're gonna want me. So in order to not get them to go with me, they're gonna have to change and that's how they change. So I'll be the scapegoat, no problem, as long as it changes. So <laughs> Yeah, you know, so it, I think it's gonna work. I think it'll work out never too. But I always wanted to make a book out of my life, like a fairy tale. Well, raised raised by the Black Panthers and strung out. So. Yeah, I think Panthers are just stuff, right? Okay. Stop it, Danny. Um, uh, he's